Good morning from Stanford University. My name is Will Chu. I'm the faculty co-director of Storage X Initiative, um, along with Professor Itui. We're delighted to welcome you today um, to another Storage X seminar. So we have a very interesting topic today. One of the key beliefs at Stanford is that we need to span all the way from atoms to systems when it comes to cross-cutting energy storage. And that is exactly what we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna to be examining the holistic picture for energy storage, <clears throat> not only for uh, transportation, but also for grid and beyond. What do I mean by holistic? Um, when it comes to technology development, deployment and optimization, one really has to consider how everything interacts at the smallest level, whether it is the materials, the battery cells, uh, if we're talking about battery technology, to the battery packs, and if we're talking about grid level storage, how the battery packs are configured, how they're deployed, and what applications they're being used. And it is an increasingly important topic because a lot of efficiency and economy can be gained from this level of optimization. And we are delighted to have two experts to speak to that. Uh, first, uh, we have Professor Jessica Trensik. Uh, Jessica is a professor at the Institute for Data Systems and Society at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And this is exactly her area of expertise, focused on system level analysis to inform policy and technology deployment. And her interest not only includes uh, energy storage, uh, but other forms of energy conversion as well, including hydrogen, low carbon fuels, uh, nuclear, and many others. And our second speaker will give the industrial perspective. Uh, Dr. Nicolo Campanel from McKinsey uh, and Company will be talking about the electrification of, of transportation. And he's gonna tackle a rather specific system level problem, which is comparing two chemistries, LFP, lithium iron phosphate, and NMC, nickel manganese cobalt oxide, for two very different type of battery technology at the materials level, and how those differences will propagate to the system level, and how that is influencing the skill up, the technical omics, and how companies are making choices when it comes to selecting the technology. So I'm really delighted uh, to be hosting both of them. So if I can ask uh, Jessica, to come to the stage. As I already mentioned, Jessica is a professor at MIT. And Jessica, we're really looking forward to hear your thoughts on system level analysis and how it can inform policy and decision making. Thank you so much, uh, Will. And it's great to be here. OK, so today I'm going to be talking about energy storage for deep decarbonization. And I want to start with some background on climate change to motivate this discussion of energy storage. Um, as many of you know, climate change impacts uh, such as wildfires, um, uh, as the image shows here, and many others threaten human livelihoods and even human life. And Addressing this risk uh, requires completely decoupling greenhouse gas emissions and human economic activity. So the goal really is a return to a carbon cycle on Earth that is in balance, where processes emitting carbon dioxide are balanced by processes absorbing carbon dioxide and the emissions of other greenhouse gases such as methane and nitrous oxide are stemmed. So quantitatively, what is needed? Um, well, staying below a two degrees Celsius global temperature rise uh, in order to limit the damage of climate change requires a rapid reversal of rising greenhouse gas emissions trends. So I'm showing on this plot several uh, of the trends that emissions, CO2 emissions could follow here, where depending on when the decline begins, the decline um, is either shallower or steeper. Uh, but what's needed is a rapid reversal of rising greenhouse gas emissions trends. And what has to happen is that emissions should fall faster than they've risen for over a century. This also likely means that wealthier economies should reach net zero emissions targets by mid-century. So that's within three decades. 
Now, if we're talking about 1.5 degrees Celsius, the reversal would have to be even more dramatic. And either way, time is short and financial resources are never unlimited. So my work is all about informing innovation toward this future. And what we do in my group is to develop data-informed models, both data-driven and mechanistic models that can allow us to be more deliberate and effective in developing successful technological solutions. So the idea is to you know, recognize always the uncertainty about the future, but to use insights that we can gain from um, past experiences in order to inform future technology development in order to increase the chances of success. Uh, so my research objective, this objective is shown here, it's to understand and shape technological innovation, especially in clean energy systems to accelerate equitable climate solutions. And today I'll be presenting some examples from my work on energy storage. Just very briefly, the methods that uh, we use and, and develop, many of them we've developed in my group, um, you know, involve developing data and form models. They can be mechanistic or data-based to measure technological innovation, understand the drivers and identify targets. And these models can be applied across scales from materials to devices to infrastructure applied to hardware and also non-hardware technology. And the impact of this work, the um, intended impact is to inform materials, technology, and infrastructure decisions by engineers, private investors, policymakers, and the public. And I should also add, um, well, I guess it's shown here. Yeah, it's, it's really about informing engineering as well as private investing, policymaking, and sometimes um, the decisions that consumers make. Okay, so I'm gonna to briefly touch on the role of energy storage in deep decarbonization, and then we'll get right into discussing some examples from my research on informing and ideally, hopefully accelerating progress on energy storage. I also look forward to the Q&A session that's coming up. So what really is the role of energy storage in deep decarbonization? When we think about all of the different energy storage technologies that are out there, you know, ranging from batteries to pumped hydro storage to compressed air energy storage, and all of the realizations of those types of storage, I often say that the set of energy storage technologies is as diverse and, and likely more diverse than the set of possible energy conversion technologies. But what is the role of energy storage? What could it be? Uh, what role could it play in deep decarbonization? Uh, well, it can certainly help enable the electrification of transportation. So there are two primary electric vehicles, hydrogen fuel cell vehicles and uh, battery electric vehicles. Battery electric vehicles have been growing in popularity and in market adoption. And that has been largely enabled by the improvements we've seen in lithium ion battery technologies in recent decades. So energy storage can play a key role in electrifying and, and thereby decarbonizing transportation, uh, especially if the electricity mix decarbonizes. And storage can also help there because it is one of the ways in which we can help support the integration of variable renewable energy, inc including solar and wind energy, um, into the power grid in order to decarbonize electricity. And as you may see here that, uh, and, and I'll show sort of quantitatively how this plays out through some of the examples we'll go through, but as the economy electrifies, the importance of, importance of energy storage grows. So one of the main ways to decarbonize the entire economy is to, per, is to electrify as many energy services as possible. So services like transportation, various industrial energy services uh, requiring, you know, processes requiring high temperature. Um, you know, some may be a little bit more difficult to, the, the highest temperature processes are more difficult to electrify, but other aspects of industrial energy services can be electrified. Home heating can be electrified and so forth. Now, all of this needs to be supported by um, a reliable decarbonized electricity supply mix and storage can play an important role here. But basically the, the point I wanna make here is that as the economy electrifies and decarbonizes, the importance of energy storage is likely to grow. So it can be a really essential component to reaching the climate change mitigation targets that I started out uh, with showing. 
The good news is that we've seen very significant progress in lithium ion battery technologies. And as I mentioned a minute ago, that has enabled um, you know, the prospects and also the already the adoption of electric vehicles. Um, as my group uh, documented together with Micah Ziegler, uh, my postdoc, we published a paper in 2021 uh, showing and estimating the cost decline in lithium ion batteries uh, these costs have fallen by 97% over three decades. Uh, that is a very rapid cost decline. And um, there have been improvements in other key technologies, namely two key technologies, that's solar energy and wind energy. Because of these three trends that I'm showing here, because of the falling costs of solar energy, wind energy, and lithium ion batteries, and also because of increasing density, energy densities in lithium ion batteries, we're in a very different place to where we were just you know, 10 years ago or even five years ago in talking about decarbonizing the economy. Um, but there's more work to be done uh, because of course we need to actually see that downward trend in emissions that I started out showing. And in some areas, um, the technologies, you know, building on these three technologies and other technologies that are available, um, some energy services are currently at least technical in, in terms of the techno technological uh, availability, they're currently easier to decarbonize. Um, that's a technical potential. They still have to be decarbonized. There are other energy services that are currently more difficult to decarbonize. So if we look at this pie chart, uh, we can see that um, you know, long distance road transportation is flagged. Um, certain industrial energy um, services are flagged for um, steel production, cement production and then what's called load following electricity. So that's really when um, you, know, you get to that final push of decarbonizing electricity. As I'll show in a little bit, we need uh, certain um, technological capabilities that we don't yet have and storage can play a really critical role there. So you know, the role for storage is really widespread across many of these energy services. So in decarbonizing uh, home heating, as I mentioned, many industrial energy services, um, you know, meet light and medium um, duty transportation, you know, um, much of that can, tech, you know, technologically speaking, be electrified. Um, and, you know, certainly electricity. Now, for all of these energy services that are not labeled as currently more difficult to decarbonize, further development of storage will help to accelerate the process of electrification and decarbonization. So that's really important. But also further development of energy storage is really critical to um, this piece of the pie, the load following electricity, um, because it could allow for greater renewables, renewable energy adoption, um, and decarbonizing the uh, decarbonize, full decarbonization of electricity. And so let me now get into some research examples on you know, how we can use models to inform and accelerate progress. You know, given that time is short and the important role of energy storage and decarbonization, can we be a little bit more deliberate um, than we would otherwise be by examining what the targets are for storage performance, as well as what drives rapid progress. So in the case of lithium ion batteries, we saw that 97% cost decline in lithium ion batteries, solar energy costs um, for PV modules have fallen by 99%. Um, that happened over, it's actually a bit more than that now, but that happened over four decades. Uh, these are very rapid cost declines, but what is underneath them and can we learn what, what this reason for success was in order to inform future efforts? Um, so that is uh, what I'm going to be talking about. I'll give some examples of recent papers that we've published and uh, you'll get a sense for the methodologies that um, I've developed um, to address these, these types of questions. Okay, so now let's talk about targets for 
collective innovation processes to work towards. So here the idea is, you know, not to stem creativity and research or anything like that, but it's to ask for certain technological components, and in this case, energy storage, what sort of performance do we need? And we're gonna be focusing now on cost performance, but we could look at other types of performance. What sort of performance might we need in order to support an overall decarbonization of the system? So you can start to think about maybe how you would go about setting up such a problem and a model. And I'll walk through an example of the method that we've developed in this area. Okay, so uh, what I'm gonna walk through is this first example, which is on cost targets for grid scale energy storage. So have a look at this plot. What I'm showing here is the, our, our two capacity costs for energy storage. We have the power capacity cost on the y-axis and the energy capacity cost on the x-axis. So this is the capacity cost for storage. We have different storage technology shown in this main plot. We have pumped hydro storage, compressed air energy storage, and lead acid. There's a lot of data uncertainty and also underlying variability in the cost. So that's why we have these wide ranges for different um, technologies. Now, if I asked you, um, you know, for example, if I point at um, one of these center points here in the, um, the lead acid uh, cost data points, right? So I look at this point. And let's say I also look at uh, this data point here, sort of up in the lower left here for uh, compressed air energy storage. And I asked you, which uh, technology costs less? Which, which one has lower costs? Well, it's a trick question because you can't answer it because you know, there are two dimensions here and neither one is dominating, neither one of these data points is dominating along both dimensions. So what do I need? Well, I need some sort of model to tell me what are the features um, of cost in this case of this technology that would allow it to be uh, high performing in a particular context. And so the example that I'm showing here, and I'll just mention, I'll walk through that very briefly, is the context of performing price arbitrage with energy storage that is storing uh, solar energy in Texas. And that is where I get what are called these, what we call these ISO cost lines. So these are ISO performance lines. Once I have these lines, then I can see that this data point here, the compressed air energy storage data point, or really any storage technology that had this cost structure, so a lower energy capacity cost um, and a higher power capacity cost, would be advantageous as compared to that first data point. Uh, so this line here is an ISO performance line. As we get toward the origin, performance increases. So this is what's telling me that, um, you know, the line here is coming from a model um, where we're looking at the context in which storage is being used. And that is really what's telling me which of these data points is advantageous at this point in time. Uh, in the case of storage, what the model really has to address is the resource management problem, because really that is the sort of raison d'etre, the, the you know, reason for energy storage is to manage resources, right? You store energy at some point, you convert it to some useful form of energy at some later point. And so we need to model what is the exact resource management problem that our storage technologies are gonna be addressing. And then from there, we can estimate desirable, we, we can gain insight about desirable technology features and maybe even estimate rough targets for performance, in this case for um, cost performance. Uh, so how do we manage the resource, uh, how do we model rather the resource management problem? Well, at the heart of this, we have to consider fluctuations. We have to consider fluctuations in solar and wind energy. Um, in this case, which is what I'm showing here, we also have to consider fluctuations in energy demands and also the overall supply mix that we're using to provide electricity as in this case. Uh, so if we look at price arbitrage, um, then what, we, what would happen to the solar and wind output, and that's where those ISO performance lines came from, is that it becomes more peaked, right? So you see output uh, following these sorts of trends. 
Um, we can also look at another resource management problem, which is one that we looked at um, and published a paper on in 2019, using that methodology that we had advanced for this paper in um, 2016. We applied that same methodology to a paper in 2019, but looked at a different resource management problem, which was to provide reliable electricity um, output to match the output shapes of different uh, power plants, different types of power plants that are operating on the grid today. So we have baseload plants, we have intermediate plants, um, we have bi-peaker plants, and we have peaker plants. And we looked at a handful of different uh, locations and looked at how storage would optimally operate for wind and solar in order to meet the challenge uh, presented by this resource management problem. And so what are the results of that? I'm going to get a little bit deeper into this problem because this is really one of the key challenges that storage could potentially meet. Um, and that is to be able to help provide that load following electricity in a deeply decarbonized system. But the question is how well do current costs of energy storage compared to where costs would need to be in order to serve this role while also supporting low cost electricity. Um, so what we find is, um, you know, when we go through and, and we optimize the different sizes for different technological components in our system, um, you know, what, what we find is that the optimal size of the renewables capacity here, I'm showing photovoltaics versus the storage capacity, that optimal size is going to depend on the cost of the different technological components as we might expect. So what you can see here is that as we go from, um, you know, a lower en energy storage uh, capacity cost um, and, and a lower, um, just storage cost overall to a higher one, um, what we see and, and focusing on um, the energy um, the energy capacity, so that x-axis that I showed a minute ago, uh, the energy capacity costs, what we see is that as the energy capacity costs um, uh, increase, uh, we see further oversizing of the photovoltaics power capacity. So that's what we see in the lower left-hand plot. And uh, we also see an increase in the storage power capacity. Um, again, as the cost of energy capacity of storage increases, uh, we also see a drop in the storage duration and also the storage energy capacity as the cost of storage energy capacity increases. And so, you know, this is just to give you a sense that in the next plot, what I'm going to be showing are these um, cost are, are the cost targets and the costs that I'm going to be showing in the next plot are based on this cost minimization process. So what do we learn about cost targets? Well, what I'm showing here is for a hypothetical scenario where we would be relying on 100% variable renewable energy. Uh, so optimal combinations, cost optimal combinations of solar and wind energy across these four different locations, Arizona, Iowa, Massachusetts, and Texas. And um, again, I'm showing this plot using the same axes that I started out with. So we have storage energy capacity costs on the x-axis and power capacity costs on the y-axis. And what is shown sort of on the z-axis or through the heat map color here is the levelized cost of shaped electricity. So what is the cost of reliably providing electricity? Let's focus on Texas for a minute. Um, with variable renewable energy and energy storage, and how does that cost of electricity depend on the different storage costs? And so that's what we're showing if we focus on that lower left-hand panel there. Now, the other thing I might wanna ask is that I might wanna ask what are, what are cost competitive targets? If I, looked at, if I look at other generation technologies, uh, over here on the right, we can see that we've estimated certain cost competitiveness targets 
Uh, so at what point in this plot here do I reach cost competitiveness as defined by these other technologies? Well, what you can see is that we really want to be in that dark blue region. And so costs really have to fall to, you know, 10 to 20 or even in some cases lower um, dollars per kilowatt hour in terms of the energy capacity cost. We can survive, you know, with higher power capacity costs. And I'll show why that is in just a minute. But, you know, the idea and there's there's no single cost target across locations and um, you know, this plot is intended to show different ranges of the cost of electricity as depends on the storage cost. But what we do see is that we have to see a significant drop in costs if we compare to battery technologies today, let's say lithium ion battery technology costs, one would need to see a, you know, 80 to 90% drop in costs in order to reach um, this dark blue region here. And you know, so that kind of gives us a sense of this cost target. So the cost target that we published um, is again a range. Um, it's around 10 to $20 per kilowatt hour in some places lower and some places higher. And this would be for a mix that's relying uh, fully on variable renewable energy. So now we have our cost targets, and uh, but you might be asking, well, Jessica, what about uh, if you consider other energy supply mixes? Maybe we don't want to rely entirely on variable renewable energy. Um, you know, there may be other supply technologies that can be used in order to help us get to deep decarbonization. So what does that do to the storage cost target? Well, this is what uh, we can see here. And what I'm showing here on the x-axis is the equivalent availability factor. And uh, what this is essentially a proxy for is the percentage of electricity that's coming from renewables. So if we drop that equivalent availability factor by just 5%, we use just 5% of something else, we can see a significant drop in the cost of electricity uh, you know, for example, for base load wind, that cost can drop by, um, you know, 30% um, or in some cases even more just by using 5% of something else. And if we do that, when we look at, for example, a 95% equivalent availability factor, then the storage cost targets rise, they get closer to where battery costs are today. Of course, batteries aren't the only option for storage. One of the reasons why a lot of focus is placed on them, as you all know, is that they can be installed you know, pretty much anywhere, whereas some of those other technologies like pumped hydro storage uh, are limited to certain geographical regions. Now, I should point out that pumped hydro storage does have a favorable cost structure, but of course we need to consider where it's available and also what impacts it would have along many dimensions other than cost. Uh, so there are arguments for really pushing forward for, with batteries, although in some locations, other storage technologies may be available. But in any case, so what is the bottom line here? The bottom line is that we could use, if, you know, if we diversify our electricity supply mix a little bit, there could still be a very important role for storage, um, you know, in smoothing out the variability in solar and wind energy. Electricity costs could drop. However, the challenge remains that that 5% needs to be met by some other source. Um, and because of certain, a certain nature of the fluctuations in the solar and wind energy resource, which I'll show you in a minute, that can present a challenge. So really one of the key results of this work that we found is the importance of the infrequent but large supply fluctuations. What you can see here is that if we look out over 20 years, there are a few events that we identified in this work that are large shortage events where you have larger than normal shortages extending over, you know, the, a few days, sometimes a week or more around that amount of time, where you have a below average uh, availability of solar energy uh, that uh, or wind energy. And these shortage events happen only a handful of times over 20 years. 
Now, if you want to move to a system that's relying entirely on renewable energy, then you know a lot of your whatever you install, um, if, if you use storage, if you install storage capacity, then that capacity would go unused for large periods of time. Uh, you can also rely on other, some of the other technologies that I mentioned, but you still would be having to meet these resource fluctuations and that can be costly really for any technology to operate in the kind of way that I'm showing here. So anyway, there's, I think this work can help us think about what target should we be aiming for? And it's not a single target, but you know, a target associated with a kind of deeply decarbonized energy system, electricity system in this case, and can sort of allow us to evaluate the efforts and the technologies that we're developing now. In addition to storage, demand side management, uh, low carbon supplemental generation, also transmission expansion, these can all play a role. Um, and we can be thinking about combining these with energy storage to manage the variability in renewable energy. So one of the things that my group is working on now is to perform this analysis. We've developed the capability to do that really anywhere in the world. And you know, really to understand how geography matters and sort of what the options are for deep decarbonization um, across locations around the globe. So very briefly, I want to take just a few minutes to go over a couple of more examples. Um, and I'm gonna give you one more example on research for targets that involves energy storage. Here I'm talking about targets for electric vehicle battery capacities, costs and charging infrastructure. And to identify targets for these technological and infrastructural components, as you can imagine, we may want to follow a similar process to what I mentioned before. And so I'm going to apply, and what we did in this work was to apply a very similar methodology to the one that we advanced for grid scale storage, which involves looking at the resource management problem. In this case, it's critical to look at uh, energy consuming behaviors of people in vehicles and the diversity in energy consuming behaviors. We want to consider battery capacities, battery costs, uh, charging locations, and charging power. And the idea is to estimate targets for batteries and charging infrastructure um, that could really help with electric vehicle adoption. And so that's what we did in this research. And you know, what we were able to do is to model the energy consuming um, patterns of people in vehicles around the US, uh, looking at where they stop for how long, and then from there, thinking about and identifying um, strategic locations for charging stations, the power that these stations should have, um, and also then quanti importantly quantify the effects on the technical adoption potential of electric vehicles. So what we found was that really layering on home charging, it can be of the level two variety and then workplace charging, highway fast charging, as well as um, charging at certain overnight locations. You know, th this a, a combination of these approaches can support electric vehicle adoption and importantly, you know, what this set of strategies allows you to do would be to mix and match different strategies depending on the particular situation in, you know, particular regions. Um, and so that's something that, um, you know, um, is, is sort of helping with planning and, and thinking about where to invest in electric vehicle charging, considering people's behaviors. And, and essentially the goal here was to, you know, find, charging, identify charging infrastructure locations that can offer convenience uh, to people. Now, when it comes to batteries in this context, what's important to consider is that, um, you know, it's really the lower cost electric vehicles, which have lower battery capacities that most people would be able to afford. So if we're talking about rapid adoption of electric vehicles, we need to think about planning the charging infrastructure around the battery capacities that people can afford. As battery capacities increase, energy densities improve and so forth, then um, you know, the possibilities for um, charging infrastructure, you know, it, it gives you a little bit more wiggle room. Uh, but at this point in time, considering the urgency of the problem, it's important to 
plan around capacities um, that are close to the vehicles that are available today at low cost, and then also plan in flexibility for the future as battery technology continues to evolve. Okay, so just in a couple, I think two remaining minutes, I just wanna to touch on very briefly another kind of research. Um, what I've talked about so far is about estimating targets for these important technological components, in this case, uh, different types of energy storage that can help for rapid decarbonization. Uh, but what about the process of getting to where we are from at this point until to the process of getting from where we are now to reaching those targets. Um, that is going to take a certain amount of time. It's going to take a certain amount of investment. How can we make that process more deliberate? Well, one of the methodologies that we've advanced is to understand the mechanisms of technology innovation. So I was initially motivated to look at this problem by the technology of uh, photovoltaic modules, which, as I mentioned, declined in cost by 99% over four decades. We've since then confirmed, last year in 2021, we confirmed that lithium-ion battery technologies have seen similar rates of improvement. So these are really standout technologies in terms of their rates of improvement. Um, but the motivation originally for this was photovoltaics and asking, you know, I would go around and, and talk to people and say, why do you think the cost fell? And everybody had a different answer. So, you know, that really begs the question, how can we study this quantitatively? And so that was the motivation for this model uh, to really understand the mechanisms driving technological improvement. Uh, technological improvement happens at three different it happens at many different levels here. I've aggregated these mechanisms into three levels. So we can think about low level mechanisms. Those are mechanisms you know, happening at the level of devices or manufacturing processes um, that affect costs. And then high level mechanisms are things like research and development, learning by doing, economies of scale. And then policies are, you know, certain uh, government uh, policies can play a critical role in stimulating either activity in research and development directly, that's government funded R&D, or in incentivizing the growth in markets. And, you know, in the case of solar energy, um, you know, both of these policies were really essential in driving down the cost of solar energy. Um, and so, Really, the quantitative innovation in this work here is in point two, what I'm showing here. And that's really in the basic idea is to relate engineering variables to cost change. And the challenge comes in in that you have many variables changing all at once, and they're not all additive. You know, you have many, um, you know, variables like something like efficiency is unitless. It's not an additive cost component, but it has an effect on many other cost components. So in this model, what we're able to do is sort of tease out the contribution of these different variables that combine in different ways, not only additively, when many variables are changing all at once. And I'm gonna jump forward to the results that we got when we looked at uh, technological change. Um, in lithium ion battery technology and specifically lithium ion battery technology costs to see you know, between two periods of time as indicated on this plot here, what were the main drivers of the cost decline? And in the interest of time, I'm gonna jump forward to the results. Um, so here are the different variables that we looked at and this is available in our paper. I'm not gonna go through all of these detailed variables but we have a cost model that relates these engineering variables to costs. And then we looked at high level mechanisms. One of the things that you'll notice is that R&D played a really important role here and that includes both public R&D and private R&D. The other thing that we were interested in is, you know, what is that R&D? And we were able to identify that chemistry and material science played a really essential role within that category of research and development. Some of the general insights that we arrived at uh, were that research and development can be, can be a dominant mechanism of cost decline, even 
you know, after the technology is well established in the market. And again, the idea here is to move toward quantitative insights, because of course we could say, yes, research and development is important, but the question is really, you know, how important is it? How does it compare to economies of scale? And what might we learn from the underlying mechanisms in terms of what could be effective as an approach going forward? And, um, you know, one of the things we learned about those mechanisms is that one of the reasons why this technology may have succeeded is that it had access to diverse chemistries and materials that could be combined in a modular design. And so that's something that could also help other battery technologies. The model that we developed can also be applied prospectively to examine strategies for the future for different electrochemical batteries or really any technology. It, it's a, adapted to the particular technology, but that's something that can be done. And the idea is that we want to use these models to uh, support advanced evaluation, prospective evaluation of development strategies for technology. So I will stop there. I hope that uh, these examples have given you a sense for how we can potentially be more deliberate to support and maybe even accelerate progress in storage technologies and other technologies that are essential for society. Um, and I look forward to your questions. Jessica, thank you so much for the wonderful presentation. Um, we have quite a bit of questions, but we're a little bit out of time. So let me just pick on a few um, key ones. So in, in, in the first half of your presentation, uh, in discussing grid level energy storage, um, you, you showed a large number of plots on uh, dependence to region, time, and so forth. And I noticed that many of those plots are fairly monotonic. Um, so in terms of choosing an optimal solution, um, did your study reveal any sort of unexpected findings or unexpected optimal points um, in terms of what is the best configuration for a certain type of problem? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, the key finding of the study, which really I think applies not just to uh, informing storage development, but also thinking about demand management, um, you know, the role of supplemental generation for reaching a deeply decarbonized electricity grid, power grid, is that um, there are these large shortage events that happen infrequently, but really define the capacity of energy storage or something else that you would need in order to support this decarbonized power grid. And that was something that had been, that, that hadn't been uncovered before. So really for that study, that is the key result is really the nature of those larger supply shortages that wasn't known before. The reason it had been missed is that we had tended to focus as a community on you know, one or two years of data. But once you start to extend out over you know, 20 years of data, or longer, now we're looking at 40 years for each location, you, you know, then you start to see the, these low frequency, high amplitude fluctuations that really matter. So that was really the key, I guess, surprising results. And then of course, all of the quantitative results, what is the cost target by how much does storage, do storage costs need to drop? Uh, how important is the role of, um, combining solar and wind together, you know, those were all results that we couldn't have estimated without a quantitative model of the kind that we developed. Great. Um, another interesting aspect you showed in, in the second half of your talk is the importance of spatial resolution when it comes to optimization. And uh, I think you alluded to, to two very important aspects that this is extremely important for equitable energy access. Um, to look at the spatial dependence. And I think you were also hinting at some interesting coupling between the spatial and the temporal aspect. Um, could you maybe also point out a couple of interesting coupling that has both the spatial and the temporal component? I think you have one, one plot showing sort of the time of day of charging and the location of charging. Yeah, so, I mean, we see that, you know, generally speaking, that kind of um, coupling comes up in a couple of, you know, in a number of um, areas of transportation when we're thinking about decarbonizing other modes of transportation, other types of vehicles, not just light, 
light duty vehicles, as was the focus of our study. Um, but yeah, in that particular study, it's, it's, you know, so this is the thing, right? We want, we really need a bespoke model if we're evaluating these technologies with the goal of being, you know, a bit more deliberate about our technology development decisions. We usually need a bespoke model to address a particular energy service. And in the case of transportation, it's really important to think about that as you highlighted that temporal spatial component in order to provide convenience for people. So we really, and, and the diversity across the population, you know? So, you know, if you're in a car, like you alone are deciding where that car goes and we need to understand and provide technological options for people that, you know, that take into account their behaviors and the diversity in their behaviors. Now there are certain factors that cause certain similarities across behavior. And that is like, for example, the diurnal cycle and the fact that human beings need to sleep, most of us, right? So I don't know, over there in Silicon Valley, maybe people don't have to sleep, but um, you know, most people have to sleep and maybe for ideally seven, eight hours a night. So if you can put chargers there, then you know, they can be of a lower power variety. Wherever people park when they're at home, that can be really important. So these are the kinds of rules of thumb that we can learn about. And then for each location, you really need um, a, a different solution that matches that, matches that location. Um, but it's, you know, it's, it's, yeah, I mean, I think that for some of these decarbonization challenges, it's really important to examine behavior in this, in this very fine grained way. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, oh, Eve, please go ahead. Hi, Jessica, very nice talk. Uh, I want to ask you a question. Uh, I think it's probably embedded in your uh, model, right? So this energy storage uh, application for solar and wind for the grid, uh, we often talk about long duration, this all type of time scale right there, it's probably building in your model in the use case, like 10 hours, 72 hours or longer. So one thing has not really showing up as much, maybe even going to seasonal, right? So, uh, so how is this uh, influence in, in, in your model? And that's the first question related to that is also, uh, well, all this storage technology has a lifetime. Uh, pump hydro can go nearly forever, like half a century long. The, the, the battery one, and lead acid, maybe five years, maybe shorter, and lithium iron, I don't know, seven, eight years, 10 years. Like, how, how is the lifetime of this technology like built into the model? Yeah, yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, so the way that we d constructed the model, developed the model, um, really the, to answer your first question, the results about the duration of storage, um, that is an output of the model. So what we do is, you know, we simulate this power system in order to understand what the cost optimal mix of renewable energy, other energy supply and storage would be in order to provide a reliable electricity su supply. Um, and then what we do, and this was really, I think the key innovation in terms of relating this these sorts of simulations to technology features and really understanding how we can use models to inform the prioritization of technology features. Um, in this case, we're looking at those two dimensions of cost, but also estimate cost targets. Um, so this was really the advance that we made in that 2016 paper um, uh, with a former student of mine, Will Braff, and also Joshua Mueller. Um, and that was to, you know, essentially consider a full range of different technology costs and features. And then from there, for each cost of technology, we estimate an optimal size. And so the duration, to answer your question, you know, the storage duration that is associated with a cop cost optimal energy mix is an output of the model. And so what we see for that particular location, you know, if you're performing price arbitrage, the duration is a couple of hours, that's the optimal duration of storage, right? Um, and of course, that's the energy capacity divided by the power capacity of storage. Um, if we're looking at this deeply decarbonized energy mix, which was the example I went into in more detail, then the duration of storage that you're going for goes up to you know, above 100 hours. And the reason is 
Um, and, and this is if you're using 100% variable renewable energy. It comes down if you're using other supplemental generation. Um, but that's really essentially where you can see that is in the slopes of those ISO cost or ISO performance lines. Those slopes are the hours of duration. So that's really where um, we can see that result. But yeah, the result. So this was one of the, um, you know, the insights really allowed us to then say that yes, long duration storage is important for deep decarbonization via this pathway of using a lot of renewable, variable renewable energy. So I know that's a kind of a detailed answer, but hopefully, hopefully clear. And um, yeah, to get to your second question about lifetime. So once we have these results, so we have these cost competitive targets then we can ask how do technologies compare, real technologies that we have compare to those targets. And the lifetime is a critical determinant of the overall cost of um, a storage technology in terms of the service it provides, uh, the cost per unit service that it provides. Because if you build all of this capacity and it only lasts for you know, seven years um, versus 40 years, then you know, you're basically dividing your costs by, I mean, it's, it's a approximation we have to take into account, um, you know, um, um, various other parameters, but you're basically, you know, amortizing those costs over either 40 years or, or seven years. And so it has a huge impact on cost. So the way that lifetime comes into this is in estimating the cost of whatever the storage technology is that should be taken into account when we're looking at the cost um, estimates for these different technologies. But yeah, thanks for the questions. Yeah, thank you, Jessica. Back to you, Will. All right. Uh, I think we are a bit out of time, um, so we can have maybe the rest of the questions for the panel discussion. So uh, thank you so much, Jessica. So E, would you like to uh, okay. continue? Yeah, yeah, thank you, Will. Um, Niccolo, um, Niccolo, let me uh, bring you to the stage. Let me give an introduction to our second speaker, uh, Niccolo Campagno. He is the solution manager at uh, McKinsey. Um, certainly, I think this is first time we have McKinsey uh, background, uh, a person to give a presentation. Niccolo is, uh, well, you know, we all know McKinsey is one of the leading business consulting firm globally. Uh, Niccolo and McKinsey co-founded and now co-manages the Beatrice Insight, which is a startup within McKinsey, uh, developing new suite of uh, product and to support uh, clients to uh, in the battery industry. So Nicola has the training uh, with electrochemistry background, you know, with PhD in there, and he got PhD in 2016 uh, in Belgium and uh, doing part of his research at MIT. Uh, I think with the scientific background, now he's going to a lot of business insight. Um, he will be able to share us with very interesting insight, particularly the topic today is inter very interesting, MMC versus LFP. Uh, Nicola, let me uh, get you to share the screen and, and share your insights. Thank you very much. Can you hear me all right? Yeah. Fantastic. So thank you very much for the introduction. So hello, everybody. Again, this is uh, Nicola Campagnol, manager of um, battery insights in McKinsey. And today I'm going to talk about uh, this uh, this field between uh, these two technologies, these two chemistries, NMC and LFP, and how it's not just about chemistry, but it's also about how uh, the real world, the technology, the markets, policy, policies actually influence uh, the choices of these chemistries right there. So just uh, a couple of words about McKinsey as as you said like uh, I think McKinsey is relatively known as a company we are a business consulting firm but uh, I think one few things that people don't know is that we actually have uh, uh, for example few uh, sub companies or startups within McKinsey they are still part obviously of the uh, mother firm 
but uh, uh, we uh, act somehow uh, independently within and we focus on a specific aspect of a certain industry. So one of them is uh, mine spans, for example, focusing on uh, a mine by mine calculation, the cost, emissions and similar energy insights that gives an idea of all uh, the source of energy and how the energy transition is going to look like and the sources are going to look like. And then there are hydrogen insights and battery insights, battery insights where I belong, that we focus only on the battery uh, industries from uh, mining, if you want, like the material and so on, all the way to, to recycling. Another important thing that uh, a lot of people might don't know, uh, even uh, new clients, sometimes they were very surprised, is that we do not hire only uh, smart people from uh, finance and from uh, economics. We do, obviously, and uh, we are very proud of all those, but we also have plenty of colleagues, including me with a PhD in uh, technical uh, subjects. And in my case, uh, it's uh, electrochemistry and, and batteries, but we also have plenty of uh, uh, colleagues who ca came from industry. So from automotive OEMs, from uh, cell players, from active material players uh, and so on, uh, who joined the firm and actually build the knowledge and bring the knowledge uh, to, uh, to our projects. And lastly, and this is something that I was particularly interested in when I joined uh, the firm and I was so happy to be able to do, is that for many aspects, we actually have our own, we produce our own data. So in the case of automotive here, it's uh, me tier in a teardown lab of our uh, of batteries and uh, automotive. So we tore down cars uh, in the recent past including the battery cells, and I was uh, uh, responsible for the battery cells tear down. So this is a great occasion for us uh, to actually learn how uh, the industry produces these uh, battery cells and how they, they look like internally. And it gives really like the, the knowledge, it gives us the knowledge to deliver a better job, basically to deliver better insights to our clients because we are, they are based not only on knowledge that are, that are predating uh, McKinsey, so okay, case of people with uh, uh, industry experience, or uh, due only to academic work, but actual real uh, data from, from the real world. So in my talk today, uh, and it's about, uh, uh, again, LFP and NMC, I will talk about a bit about the basics, so the science behind it, not going too deep in details. I know there are plenty of uh, uh, smart uh, people with uh, PhDs and whatnot in electrochemistry, so I'm not uh, claiming to teach you these kind of things, obviously. But an, an interesting uh, jump that I will do, uh, at least for me, uh, when I was at the university especially, is uh, how this science actually translates in real life. So what's going on and why in, uh, uh, in the real world out there. And then how the choices that we are taking today actually influence the future trends. So without further ado, <laughs> easy, what's, uh, what's in a battery, right? So uh, a battery normally is formed by, form by modules and then cells. Okay, cells really are what we normally call, uh, many of us call batteries, but that's, uh, that's the, the technical name. And every cell, whatever chemistry you are working with, is composed by an anode, an electrolyte, with or without separator, and a cathode. And if we have to take six parameters, six performance parameters, uh, we say like, these are the important things that I want to look into for my battery, right? Uh, although all three components play a role in all, you might, try, you might group them and say that the anode is actually mostly responsible for, our, for the charging speed uh, and the number of cycles. The electrolyte is mostly connected to the safety of the battery uh, and the battery cell in particular. And uh, the cathode is responsible both for the sustainability uh, as well as for energy density, which gives the range in the case of a car. And finally, uh, for the cost. It's the most expensive component of the uh, cell, so it's driving the cost of it. If we take the most common chem chemistry, cathode active material chemistries today, these are lithium iron phosphate. So it's somehow a fertilizer with a bit of lithium inside and a layer structure, uh, nickel manganese uh, cobalt oxide that is uh, intercalated with lithium. Okay, it's called NMC. Okay, these are the two beasts that uh, we consider normally when uh, we talk about uh, um, lithium ion batteries today. There are not, these are absolutely not the only ones, absolutely not the case, but they are far by far the most common. So if we compare the two of them in the same scale of values, if you want, it's a bit qualitative, obviously, but it gives an idea uh, that we were comparing uh, the cathode anode electrolyte before. We see that 
at first glance, LFP is quite well performing. So it's better in safety, potentially better in lifespan. This is obviously up for debate, depends on the condition and similar. For sure, it's better in cost and uh, uh, in specific power for the way it's actually produced because it normally you make smaller particles for um, for LFP than you normally do for NMC, which is, uh, as most of us uh, uh, might know about kinetics, drive uh, what you can do in terms of power. On sustainability, the, the fact that LFP is actually made for some so uh, uh, common materials, okay, normally should drive the uh, better sustainability overall, in theory at least, versus NMC, which is based on the transition metals, nickel, cobalt in particular, that are more difficult to mine and therefore have more energy in, that you have to put in and therefore more, uh, more, more CO2. In all this, we see that there is one parameter which is uh, where NMC is winning, which is specific energy. And specific energy, it's actually the most important parameters for one uh, market, which is mobility. And mobility drives, the, drives basically the demand for batteries today, as well as probably in the short future. So although LFP looks better a bit across the board, if you want, uh, you actually have NMC, which is best for the main applications of, of it. And according to uh, one of our scenarios, it's going to be uh, the same also in the future. We're keeping the same uh, uh, anode and same uh, electrolyte. Okay. So, according to the science, according to what you would, you know, you would drive through, you know, draw down. Okay, this is better for this. This is better for us. You would expect NMC to be leading almost 100% in, uh, in mobility applications, while LFP taking the lead in, uh, in grid storage. And this is where we want to, to move away from the size, move away from the lab and have a look actually what's happening in the real world. Well, in the real world, especially in the recent past, it was often exactly the opposite. So you have is in China in particular, which is the biggest market for batteries, there was a particular attention on LFP. And you have plenty of uh, vehicles where, which were running with LFP batteries. At the same time, in the Western world and uh, Far East, uh, so Korea and Japan, you would see plenty of uh, NMC powered uh, grid storage. A among the biggest one, even the biggest one actually that comes to mind, lithium ion uh, ESS uh, fields, like you know, plants, if you want to call them like that, they're actually based on NMC still today. And now we are moving towards LFP, even for those applications. So why? Why is it? Why is it the case that it's, it's often, not always, but it was often exactly the opposite. Well, there are several, several uh, reasons for that, several uh, aspects and several drivers. One of them is uh, governments, which play an important role. And uh, Jessica was actually referring to that as well. And so it was quite interesting. So one of the effects of uh, the policies that was adopted by the Chinese government uh, on, uh, um, for safety for buses basically was to, and, and they didn't formalize it, but basically they, they didn't put NMC producers, foreign NMC producer, because most of the NMC producers were foreigners, in the, uh, in the list of the players could get uh, um, a tax rebate or anyway, um, a subsidy for batteries for uh, buses. And that drove all the industry to move towards LFP. In, uh, in China. So all bus, virtually all buses that are produced in China use LFP. And this is actually the, the golden standard also outside, uh, outside China by now. And at the same time, the same government for other reasons decided that uh, they wanted to push their uh, um, electric vehicle uh, passenger cars industry towards a uh, product with higher performance in terms of, of uh, range. So they were, giving subsidies only to cars or graduated in uh, uh, and higher for cars with longer range than uh, cars with shorter range. What happened then is that the Chinese uh, automotive player decided to change, not only make batteries bigger, but also change the chemistry from what was uh, adopted before LFP to uh, NMC. So very interesting how, even indirectly, I don't think uh, that you don't have to, to see one, uh, one of these government acting 
in the interest of one specific chemistry. Obviously, they don't care, but they always try to do their best for uh, for what the, the people want, right? But in in pushing this direction, actually, they push exactly this, the different, like the, the the opposite direction, two different types of industry. So it's quite interesting the results uh, of the policies. Uh, at the same time. There is another very important driver, which is uh, technology. Okay, so again, from our lab uh, experience, we know that okay, NMC should be more expensive and have uh, has normally higher energy density, but LFP is on the opposite row, so lower energy density but cheaper. Well, if we take two cells that we open from our tear down in China, we observe that that LFP cell that we open and that NMC eight one one that uh, cell that we open actually had a raw material cost that was almost on pair. So the drivers were uh, several. One reason was that the cathode, uh, the cathode thickness was uh, much smaller in the case of the LFP versus the MC. The, the cell itself was smaller, therefore there was more packaging than, than pack. But it's, uh, it was interesting to see that in the end, a product that you can price much lower than uh, uh, the NMC811, was made with a raw material cost that was almost the same. Therefore, pushing the price premium over raw material to a much smaller, in the case, much smaller amount uh, in comparison. So again, price <laughs> costs not all, not necessarily better for LFP if you're not uh, if you're designing in a certain way. On the other side, and this is an interesting uh, result from a Chinese producer uh, BYD in their um, BYD Han, they were able to. With a new invention, this blade battery, so skipping the module and using it directly as a, a component for, of the, or the cell as a component of the, of the pack, and in a way, also structural component for the car, they, were, they are able to use uh, an LFP chemistry guaranteeing 600 kilometers of range. The, to give an idea, today we are at around 400, like my car has around 400 kilometers of range and sports an NMC battery. So. They used a cheap technology, uh, a cheap cell, LFP, and they achieved a very high energy density, which is higher than what NMC on average can propose. So very interesting to see how these two levers can actually basically flip the results upside down. Another important, very important driver, especially today uh, uh, in the market is the price of raw materials. Price, the raw materials in this moment, they're going a bit crazy. Like uh, if you, and we could go before, huh? we could go all the way to 2020, then the, the trend will be very similar. We see that lithium today is around five times what used to be at the beginning of last year. And all the other raw materials are also up. So you have uh, nickel and cobalt up 20%, you have cobalt, uh, uh, up at 88 uh, and aluminum as well. What this entail? Well, this entail that the whole industry, whatever, whether it's batteries or not, actually, uh, saw an increase in the raw materials. Therefore, they had to improve, increase the price. And this is the first time in, I don't know, remember how long, actually, uh, Professor Tranik showed a bit of how the price went historically. It's probably the first time that we see a bump up in the price at least in the cost, but also in the price from what we hear from our customers in the price of batteries. And in a moment where we, by policies uh, everywhere in the world, we are pushing to get more electric vehicles in the market. So that's what happens. I mean, lithium is in both lithium, in both lithium ion batteries, like both in LFP and NMC, but it's LFP is still cheaper than that. So what's happening is that Many players, this is only based on announcements, so we're not even checking if they are following suit with what they are saying or not. This is just based on announcement. You see that um, while all Western players, these are only Western uh, and uh, uh, Far East Asian uh, players, uh, produce uh, uh, cars mo mostly with NMC or NCA, a lot of them in 2021 announced like, okay, we are at least exploring LFP for our entry level uh, version. So we see that the pressure in raw material prices, push the OEMs to, to, uh, to have a product, an entry level product, which is interesting for uh, customers, push them basically to explore this new chemistry, this that they were not using it before, which is for our client, this is a bit of a double edged sword. On one side, it's good for them because you know they can expand their portfolio, 
and bring more products to the market, which is great because you have more choices as a customer. On the other hand, having a, a more complex portfolio brings also complexity. So it's a very important balance that you have to strike as an OEM, considering the amount of, uh, of uh, uh, cars you produce, considering the amount of uh, demand that you have between how many uh, chemistries and how many offerings you want to give versus how many products that you, you want to, uh, in order to uh, get, uh, approach more clients. Now, this, this is all good for today, right? Already 20, this was all the announcement for 2021, but let's see what all this story of LFP and NMC will, how will this story impact the future, right? So here it's a, it's a very easy schematic of what you normally do at the end of life of this battery. So LCO, uh, lithium cobalt oxide, as well as high uh, cobalt uh, NMCs, normally would go for recycling. The value of the material is so high that it makes a lot of sense, especially with the price of raw materials today, to send it to recycle. At the same time, the, one of the reasons why LFP is so cheap is that the raw materials are cheap. So one of the reasons, so recycling doesn't really make a lot of sense. There's a lot of cost involved in recycling, and uh, there is not much to get out of it, right? Because it's iron phosphate, it's not much there, right? So reuse could be the best, best choice. In the middle, you have NCA, NMC811, and so on and so forth. All these, it's a bit of a question. Should I reuse? Should I recycle? And what, what's best? Well, the increase in LFP should, in theory, push up recycle. While if we stick more to NMC, it's, it's a bit on the higher side, you would see more, uh, sorry, uh, reuse. Well, if you see more, if you see more NMC, even today in 10 years, you would expect more recycle to happen. So that's a market that is, might be very interesting tomorrow, right? But this is not again, always the case, right? <laughs> Unfortunately, so we did a, a, a calculation also for a, a player who was interesting to do, to, to see what to do in the end with their cars, uh, with their batteries on the cars. And what we observed that for sure, for an LFP, you want to go for, uh, for reuse. There is no much value on recycling, so you rather reuse and then, uh, and then recycle. But for NMC, uh, except if you expect the raw material prices to be very high now and very, very low tomorrow, you can always recycle at the end of life, of the second life. So the, the business case of second life or reuse, it's very compelling if you're able to fix the um, their economics of it. So if you're able to have enough, if you have enough volume, and if you are uh, efficient enough in the dismantling and reassembling it, which is not too big of an effort because normally these battery packs are extracted from the car and put on racks. You don't disassemble the modules, you don't disassemble the cells. You test obviously the pack, but then you put it in a rack as is. And uh, the whole intelligence is to make or the whole product in the end is to make all the batteries work together because you can imagine you have a Nissan Leaf from 2016, you have a Tesla 3 that went in an accident two years ago. So everything has to play together. That's the, where the, the diff, where's the difficult part, not really in the disassembling and uh, reassembling. So that, that's interesting because even in, in this case, you would see that you would postpone a lot of material that would come from recycling because of the use of second life. So the business case for, for recycling, the business case for second life, they need to be taking into account all these trends, but also what is the economics of uh, each of the two. If we see the other raw materials, or a bit of all the raw materials, uh, because that's, that's also quite important to understand, okay, uh, how the market will evolve tomorrow and why would that uh, evolve in that direction. We see that cobalt and lithium are absolutely depending on batteries. So a swing in the battery demand, up or down, or a swing in the supply basically would impact each other. So it will impact prices heavily, okay? So then you see that, especially for in 2030, lithium would be mostly driven by, uh, by the use of batteries, while cobalt, because of the transition towards away from cobalt, not as much. But there is another element that is very much under spotlight uh, these days, which is nickel. Nickel is divided in nickel class one, nickel class two, nickel class one being of high purity, nickel class two, a low purity is still nickel because the element is nickel, but the products are different because there is a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, effort is needed to switch 
from one to the other, right? from one to two, not much, but from two to high purity, uh, 99, it is uh, very difficult. And you see the nickel class one actually is under a lot of pressure from batteries. We're expecting by 2030, uh, the majority of nickel class one actually to be demanded by this, uh, this industry. So what happens is that OEMs see this then the producers of cells, producers of cars, they see these trends. And so for the first time, is they are actually moving upwards in the value chain a lot. So for the first time, they're actually investing in mines. So in the past, we didn't never heard about a big OEM uh, investing on an iron ore mine. That's something so odd because it's not really their business. While now we have plenty of agreements in terms of um, take or pay, in terms of even direct investments of the low part of the value chain with the high part of the value chain with the mines to ensure that there is going to be enough investment to build these mines to guarantee there is going to be the supply of these raw materials. And let's talk a bit of, uh, of, uh, of nickel and just bring this, this example to close to, because it's, it's all a loop. Okay, so we saw that nickel prices actually influence heavily uh, which, which um, chemistry you're going to use, whether you're going to use LFP or whether you're going to use NMC in the future, right? And at the same time, the amount of NMC and LFP also influence how much nickel demand there is, which influence the price, right? So it's all really, really a loop and a circle, right? So this gives an idea, uh, just a small deep dive on, uh, on what we are expecting in terms of class one, class two demand. And you see that uh, the supply by 2030 could make it in terms of units, but it's completely decoupled, like it's not perfectly proportioned in terms of which class uh, it's needed. So there are some, while the units are there, so there is enough nickel mined or supplied by a different resource, there's going to be a shortage, potentially it's going to be a shortage of high purity uh, nickel products. And this uh, will probably potentially have impacts in terms of decisions for, uh, for OEMs and as well as miners. And we see on the right side, a bit of a, a numerical tweak of what could be in different scenarios for raw materials. And you see that, for example, comparing cobalt and nickel uh, in an NMC, you see that an increase of 200% of cobalt would not have the same impact of an increase of 200% of, uh, uh, of the nickel price. This is uh, about it from my, from my side. Thank you very much for uh, the attention. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to your questions. So thank you so much, Nicola. Well, this is a very interesting uh, comparison from uh, so many different angles. Uh, I myself certainly have uh, witnessed this whole change of LFP and MMC uh, just within the last, let's say, five, seven years or so. I mean, just very, very interesting uh, story right there. Um, so looking at these two comparisons, right, um, let me open up the uh, comparison a little bit more. Uh, I mean, in the audience, there's also uh, people asking this question. Certainly, the highest value is on the cathode. Um, and uh, if I recall, back in five, seven years ago, it look at the, uh, the battery different components cost, right? There's uh, also separator, this electrolyte, but that part just keep uh, get uh, suppressed, it's percentage-wise. Uh, Nico, do you also compare what's going on there as well? Well, so what, what happened there to make the cause? Uh, what did they do, right, to get so much lower? Yeah. Yeah. So there are three main, uh, globally, yeah? there are three main uh, um, drivers to bring down the cost, okay, or, or up. So one side, you have the technology. So how much you are able to squeeze out of this cathode. And we saw that. Uh, the cathode, even by the increase of nickel, but not necessarily, you had you basically were able to get more million per hour per gram in a, in each cathode, and that's you know that that helps the whole uh, the whole system, right? Or you are going to you were able to do, for example, you went from uh, what was I eight microns to now six five microns in terms of thickness for copper foil, and that obviously reduces the amount of copper, increase the energy density, and potentially increase the price. 
Then there is another important uh, parameters uh, parameter, which is the um, the scale. Okay, so what we do uh, in uh, in McKinsey, we have this this cost model, and we simulate the cost of each single plant in the world. So we take the global average, and the global average is pushed down by the fact there are more gigafactories uh, than uh, there, there used to be in the past. Okay, so while the single factory doesn't see this scale effect necessarily, right? The whole industry sees this push down because of uh, of uh, um, of this. Then there is another parameter which is not necessarily going down and that's raw material prices and that's what we were discussing today and uh, you know until a couple of years ago actually raw materials were you know uh, getting under control we were getting out of 2008 which uh, so raw material prices going up and now it's going down now prices are to the roof and that's what we saw uh, like lfp above 100 dollars per cell uh, per kilowatt hour per cell so it's impressive the prices of uh, spot prices today so I'll have a couple more questions. We'll feel to chime in any time. Um, so I, I also look at the, well, let's see, um, the cathode, LFP, and MMC, and is graphite. Now silicon is also coming out. Of course, graphite's cost is low. Silicon coming in increase the energy density of the cell. Would the silicon story coming in change how LFP and MNC's, uh, you know, competition. The reason to say so, right, Nicola, you are, you are aware of this, is the silicon coming in can boost up the energy density of MMC more than LFP due to the voltage reason LFP is uh, low. And the, 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 the silicon, you have some voltage loss, the boost of MMC is higher, is more, right? And then that will also is further, because a lot more energy, this will dry down the, help drive down the cost, assuming silicon size cost is can maintain low. So what, what's your, what's the thinking, you know, in uh, 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 Nicola, in your guys' analysis, did you see this uh, potential things can happen or what's your prediction? Yeah. Yeah, we are monitoring quite, uh, quite closely, both silicon uh, and all the type of silicon because there are so many different options yeah. to get uh, silicon done, right? High silicon done as well as, uh, as lithium metal, whether with solid state or not. And yeah. again, the, the math, you know, science says like, well, do an MC, right? With, uh, with, high, with silicon or even with lithium metal, you want to use an MC. Well, not really, especially with lithium metal, we see uh, more LFP for a start rather than MC. Why? Because you can keep the voltage a bit uh, more under control. So it's easier to do because there, it's much easier to make a, a LFP because LFP, it's, uh, you know, uh, you don't really have the same type of uh, purity of the air that you need uh, or control in terms of, of humidity. And so it's easier to make LFP. So what we saw, for example, is uh, one of the startup, more than one actually, was that they were, they were preparing something which is super advanced, say solid state, silicon, silicon whatever not, but they were using LFP as a, as a cathode rather than an MC. Although, as you rightfully say, you would expect the biggest boost uh, through the future. What we could see is that there is going to be a bifurcation between high performing and low uh, performing vehicles or products. And in that case, you're going to see two different drivers and mostly it's going to be cost. So if silicon also brings down cost, which is what we expect in the long term, you might see silicon on both sides. Uh, both in the high-end products or in the low end, in the low-end product. While if it doesn't, you will see it only in the high-end in the high-end products, which are normally based on NMC. Yeah. That's what we see and what we can predict at the moment. Yeah, I will. Um, Nicolo, um, outstanding presentation. I. I think it really your work highlights the importance of a system level analysis. Uh, LFP actually it's at the cell level uh, per kilowatt hour is the same cost as NMC, although most people say LFP is less expensive, but uh, it's also lower energy density. But it's really amazing to see that the improvement comes at the pack level and not at the cell level in terms of cost uh, due to higher volume and weight utilization. So I really just want to point out the importance of the system level analysis. Um, very quickly, you, you showed this really interesting slide, which is this opposite trend between China and uh, say the Western world and where China was pushing, you know, through its 2015 policy, which basically eliminated LFP from the incentive program. 
But yet, that's how the industry developed in China. And in the US, where we're pushing for grid level storage, they're going for NMC instead of LP. So everything is not making a lot of sense here. Uh, can you explain a little bit how the market developed in this way? What were the, what were the market forces uh, that led to this uh, outcome? I, I just thought it was really interesting. This Everything is <laughs> out of balance. Yeah. So it's, um, it's a bit of, that's the way it is, you know, like not much, the, and, and it started like that. So China started with this LFP, which was easier to produce. And that's probably why uh, they, they focus on that. They didn't have the same protection in terms of IP. Although for what we understand, this is not a showstopper. This is not, that's not been the showstopper, the fact that LFP was protected by IP because you can always buy and pay. Yeah? It's not, uh, it's, but uh, the, the Korean players and uh, Japanese players uh, developed first uh, NMC mostly for consumer electronics where cost was not so important and diverted into, uh, into ESS, grid storage, as well as uh, automotive in the case of the first Tesla, right? Um, and, and that's how the West, as well as Far East, got uh, the NMC propensity, like the NMC focus uh, first. And at the same time in China, because they started with LFP also to protect their own industry, although the product was less performing in terms of energy density, they, they used, used uh, different levers. And uh, I mean, safety is for sure a, a, good, a good lever because safety, it's, it's true. LFP is more safe than, so it makes a lot of sense to have, for example, a bus that is full of people with LFP. So they, they use this, uh, um, this uh, um, lever also uh, to um, somehow, yeah, th 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 these levers basically made the, the, the local producers of, LF, uh, of LFP uh, thrive in China. And then they become, became also NMC producers in the, in the, in the, like in the recent history. So, Nicole, just to confirm, so what you're saying is that the regulatory aspect of safety drove um, the scaling up of FP, whereas the incentive uh, continued to help NMC supply chain develop in China. It's not only that, but there is a, a component to that. Mm -hmm. Yes, there is a component to that. And I, as I said, uh, uh, there is plenty also of uh, IP that was the thing of, of historic uh, uh, propensity of some players to do another uh, one product rather than another. So yeah, there is uh, there, there are several aspects to it, and uh, and that's how the market developed. But at the moment, it's a bit rebalancing it uh, itself. There are there are a number of battery historians out there. Um, I, th I think uh, we should have more battery historians to look back. <laughs> back to you, E. Yeah. Well, well, I want to uh, jump in a little bit, Nicola. If you don't mind, this uh, will this question will ask. There also seems to be um, a consideration if I, you look at Chinese policy. In 2015, right, they started to, you know, only giving incentive uh, to the government incentive to the high energy chemistry MMC. But not earlier, it's, it, they wait until 2015. Uh, one reason, maybe it's a rumor, right, is because uh, the uh, MMC technology in China, the development at the time before 2015 wasn't ready to go to the global market to compete. So not until 2015, the local uh, supplier there, you know, the technology gets there, then they started to um, um, uh, giving incentive right, um, to, um, <coughs> to MMC. Uh, wait until they become a lot more competitive. Otherwise, the foreign uh, <laughs> supplier coming in will wipe out the whole Chinese market. In, in your analysis, did you see this uh, correlation? I mean, it's, it's hard to, 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 to comment on, on policies that the Chinese government or any other government uh, took. So I'm not, uh, I'm not going to, to comment on, on that. Uh, it is possible that the local players were not uh, uh, prepared, but I, I, wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't be able to say that uh, uh, it was a decision of a policy uh, targeting a certain player or a certain uh, industry to do a certain result. Yeah. It's, uh, it's hard to, to say. Maybe there is a correlation, but I, I don't know if there is any uh, causation. Yeah. Okay. Maybe I'll just ask one a last question, then we should bring uh, Jessica also to the stage. Uh, there's a question from the audience. Uh, this is interesting one. So I, 
thought, I thought about similar thing. Is there a reason, um, you know, investment and in, uh, nickel purification is uh, lagging? You mentioned, you know, class one, class two, right? High purity one is in high demand for the batteries industry. You know, we have a lot of nickel. Uh, in the world, and uh, what about purification? Uh, wouldn't that make sense to just to invest a lot more in the purification process and get a class one up there, and also low cost as well? Yeah. So the question is the cost. That's yeah. that's the big issue, right? So the without going into the details of uh, of uh, saprolite and laterite uh, type type of ore, right? So there are basically nickel likes very much iron. Right, they are really uh, they they really get along, and uh, uh, so when they are together within the ore, it's difficult to separate them. And if you have to make stainless steel, you don't have, even have to to separate them. So that brings a product in the market, which is the class two, which has a mix of nickel and and iron, which is perfect for the for the stainless steel industry, and brings down the price of nickel in the in this mix uh, at a total. Obviously, taking this out brings a lot of cost, right? And so that's why it's it's very complex to do. And even I, not always from the same ore, you can do economically, uh, you can make uh, nickel class one. So I'm not saying that there are ore that are class two and ore that are class one, that's not correct. But there are ore that are more prone to be used for class two and ore that are more prone to be used as class one. Then price can always go to the roof, and you know everything is uh, is uh, uh, economically uh, interesting at that point, right? So, but uh, except in that case, normally to 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 stay cost conscious, you rather go for, for example, um, sulfidic ores tend to be better to make um, to make uh, uh, nickel, while uh, you know mix already with iron. Um, like in the in the nickel belt, so that would be between uh, Cuba, Indonesia, and all those tend to be better uh, to make uh, uh, nickel pig iron and so on. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, with this now we have also Jessica uh, back, um, and uh, let's have uh, you know some more discussion. Uh, well, if you don't mind, let me kick off the first meeting and, and this uh, you know panel discussion. I'm looking at both of your talks, fantastic. I mean, giving, uh, uh, I think audience, giving myself, you know, many perspective, you know, from your angle, you analyze the problem. So perhaps first question I want to ask, uh, both for Jessica and Nicolo, um, your, um, in your research, your analysis, uh, particularly, you know, this lithium ion you share, some of the analysis uh, on the lithium ion. Did you see what are the technology gaps? Very clear to you to say, hi, we need to do more R&D on those. Uh, and I'm sure in our audience right here, there's a lot of people doing R&D. So they will be probably wondering whether you know, your analysis can point to the direction or confirm what, what they are working on is, uh, is worth doing. Uh, who wants to take this first? Maybe Jessica, do you want to take it first? We give uh, Nicola, uh, you know, a 30 second break. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so, I mean, I think it's a great question. Um, you know, as everybody, most people on this call and listening to this probably know within the category of uh, lithium ion battery technologies, there's quite a diversity of, um, you know, and, and so we can broaden that even further. I mean, there's a great diversity of different options and directions for R&D. Um, I think that is one of the reasons why I think it's can be useful to use the kind of model that I presented prospectively to understand, okay, if we, you know, improve these cell components, let's say we would, I mean, there's, there's really like, you know, two cost, if we're talking about costs and cost isn't the only performance metric of interest, we also, um, and as Nicolo mentioned, we care about the specific energy and the energy density for certain applications, but if we're talking about cost, there's really um, this question of, 
you know, various efficiency parameters um, and bo both in the actual cell operation, but also in the manufacturing of the technology. And then there's the question of the upfront um, material and, um, you know, labor investments that go into manufacturing any of um, one of these technologies. And so unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to give you like the silver bullet here in my answer. But what I would say is that there's always, there's often a trade-off between those two, um, at least in the um, cell operation in that, you know, we can often save on materials and, you know, low cost manufacturing processes and give up a little bit in terms of the operational efficiencies. Um, but I think it's not always straightforward ahead of time to know what that trade-off is. And that's where I think these more detailed cost models can be used to really understand what those trade-offs are. Now, going forward, as you know, um, I mean, every design decision within the cell affects other design decisions, which is why it's, it's important to really model not just the variables that I mentioned, but their interactions. And that's actually something that we're doing. So we're hoping to publish a paper in the near term, taking a couple of dominant um, lithium ion battery technology designs and applying the model that we've developed prospectively to investigate some of these, these trade-offs and try to get some quantitative insight. Um, Nicolo. I'll, uh, I had the time to take notes so uh, that Jessica didn't. <laughs> so I, I will actually go for my top three. That doesn't mean that anything else is not important, quite the opposite, but I give you my top three and you tell me what, what you think here. So for me, we really should focus on chemistry leap. So we need to go for the next gen. This is the way that we can drop both uh, cost as well as improving the energy density sustain like substantially. And that would be mostly invo involved in the uh, anode choice. That would be lithium metal or silicon. I, 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 I want to keep my, my mind open. Any of the two is a great solution, but this is really like the first objective on the short term that we can uh, do to decrease cost, uh, improve uh, CO2 emission and, uh, mm -hmm. and as well as energy density. The second one would be to go away from uh, this, uh, the, if possible, from the cathode that we have today. Okay, so try to make something which is, uh, for example, we have sulfur that might be a bit too, too well, far, uh, although there are some people who can do it today. But anyway, something that is relatively cheap and relatively well performing, it's a key to answer the, the requirements of the market today. So it's anode, cathode. And if you have to change the electrolyte, you have to change the electrolyte, obviously, but not necessarily. And the last point, if you, if you see how much does it cost, if you see like the, in the process uh, to produce a lithium ion battery, what actually takes the energy and the capex in the factory, you want to tackle the uh, drying part, okay? So that's what a lot of people are now proposing as dry coating. That could be one of the options, not the only one, but this is really like the point, the pain point that we can that you want to with the highest impact you can improve everything obviously but if you want to have a high impact 50 uh, percent uh, drop in that would have the highest impact uh, globally versus 50 percent of another part of the process yeah well thank you so much uh, nico the really good point i mean these uh, three points right there i think will is uh, uh smiling <laughs> on this you know i i can appreciate that more let me be so, uh, specific Will, feel free to chime in anytime i'm just asking specific questions still regarding to my first question hey Given the lithium cost, Nicola, you analyze, right? The percentage it will, it will take. What about sodium? Like yes, sodium, we have a sodium ion battery, guys. That is actually commercial and it's going to solve a lot of problems. But if you end up using a lot of nickel and similar, yeah, I, I'm not sure how we can yeah, get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Appreciate that. Then what about yeah. solid state, right? Well, Jessica, please. Yeah, please. Yeah, no, I mean, I was just going to say I was kind of um, I, I had to skip over these results in the presentation because we were short on time. But, um, you know, it's interesting also to map on some of the results that we see going back in time, um, looking at what drove uh, lithium ion battery technology costs down. Uh, compared to what Nico said. So, you know, if we look at, for example, we grouped a set of variables that we looked at in terms of 
uh, cell performance changes. So that includes, you know, changes to the cell charge density, capac charge capacity utilization, cell voltage, cathode, cathode um, foil area was another one. And what we see is that the contribution of cell charge density is by far the dominant one um, among that category. So much larger than, for example, cell voltage, um, which was much smaller. Now that isn't to say that is what will happen in the future, but I think it's really interesting. And, and there are some arguments for really emphasizing that. And then the other major contributor is cathode materials prices. Um, looking back. And so that's also interesting. Um, you know, and then plant size. I mean, I did mention that research and development had a dominant effect, and that's both from the private sector and public sector on cost decline, but also, you know, economies of scale um, and processes that can rapidly be scaled up. That is also um, something to consider. Yeah, thank you. Will, do you want to ask? Absolutely. Such an interesting discussion. Um, Jessica and Nicola, I really appreciate you looking back, right? Because we have now so much data uh, for the development of the battery field. Jessica, you have also compared to the solar field. Um, so, so I want to ask a little bit on, on this aspect, right? So a lot of people are saying, okay, maybe, you know, this is it. Lithium ion battery has won. It, it's the cost learning curve. It's impossible to compete. But if we look back historically and we look at lead acid, the transition to nickel metal hydride, the transition to lithium ion, what lesson can we learn here? And, 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 and the specific question I like to pose is, in my mind, there is a certain learning curve. Right? Jessica, you mentioned the solar cell and lithium ion battery were very similar on the, on the cost learning curve. So that's probably kind of the best case scenario for any new technology. So what comes to mind is, it's the gain in the improvement in the properties and the performance of the technology that really has to be high in order to justify um, even operating at the same cost learning curve. And then the, the related question I have is, do you see an opportunity for accelerating the cost learning curve for the next generation technology so that you can learn everything we have learned for lithium ion battery and then make the next cost learning faster? So I know this is a lot of question packed into one, but yeah, really want to build off what you have presented on the past uh, performance, the past data, looking at the evolution of the industry. Jessica? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, no, I mean, I think I definitely do feel that we can be more deliberate in technology innovation. It's not to say we're always going to make the perfect choices, but if you think about how a lot of the choices are made today or, you know, sort of maybe it's changing a little bit now, but it's it's a little bit of a random process in a sense and sort of intuition guided. But I think that we can, for example, um, you know, both in, like I was presenting on both in estimating targets, you know, so for example, you, you, you know, and in looking at what specific, um, design decisions might allow for both re more rapid improvement and then also the greatest quantitative improvement in cost or some other performance um, metric. So um, you were taking the example of lithium ion battery technologies and asking, you know, and I think one of the participants also asked a question I saw in the Q&A, you know, is this technology going to um, I mean, you didn't ask the question this way, Will, but you know, other people will ask like, well, do we need anything else, right? Should we just push on this, right? Um, and I think that putting some numbers on the performance that would be needed um, for certain applications for storage, you know, so for example, estimating that we still need an additional 80 to 90% cost decline in our, um, battery technologies if they are to work in the role that I studied for providing reliable, deeply decarbonized electricity, where the electricity is mostly coming from solar and wind, you know, that is kind of giving us a sense of how we should, you know, like how much we should diversify across different chemistries, battery designs, et cetera. Um, and I think the answer is we still need that diversification because it's not clear also based on, you know, the analyses that we've done and others have done that there really is going to 
it's really going to be possible for battery uh, for lithium ion battery technologies within that set to drop in cost by that much. So, yeah. And Jessica, this is a great point. And if you look at solar, it's, it's kind of an interesting discussion, right? Because solar is about 15, 15 years ahead of batteries. So that was one in which the technology diversification never quite happened. There was many attempts at displacing silicon and many discussions of new technology that could be lower in price, better in performance. Um, but at least I think over the past 15 years, this really hasn't taken place. So I wonder if you have any thoughts on the learnings from the solar industry. Yeah, I mean, I would say we can't compare, you know, energy storage with solar energy. So as I mentioned, you know, the set of energy storage technologies, it's like such a large set, as you well know, and, you know, most people on this call know, there's so many options, even within electrochemical batteries, um, and they can serve different purposes. So, you know, in the case of solar energy, um, there was a certain dominant design based on silicon. Silicon isn't the ideal band gap material, but it has certain properties that make it easy to work with, which is also why cost. I think there's a lesson there for battery technology, you know, thinking which, which uh, materials lend themselves to scalability and, um, you know, sort of easy to scale manufacturing processes. Um, but it wasn't the ideal material. Um, however, it, I mean, it wasn't the ideal material from a band gap perspective, but it had other advantages and it has really come to dominate the market. There are other photovoltaic technologies that could still grow and meet certain uh, specific applications, you know, like, um, you know, for residential applications and, and so forth. So, Anyway, but solar energy was is a certain conversion and photovoltaics rather is a certain conversion technology. When we talk about energy storage, electrochemical batteries, even lithium ion battery technologies, there's such a diversity of different, you know, chemistries and designs that we're thinking about. And so I think it's really not a one-to-one -one comparison. The other thing is that, and this was also mentioned by um, Nicolo, is that when we when we look at how like what markets drove adoption in lithium ion battery technologies and then where the cost in our work where the cost decline came from what you can you know and and also what we did in one of the 2021 papers that i presented was to look at if we adjust the cost decline for increases in battery energy density and specific energy you know what would the rates of cost improvement look like and just to kind of keep this answer somewhat relatively short. I mean, I know it's been already a long answer, but um, you're also asking hard questions. So um, that require long answers. So I can't take, I don't have to take full responsibility for that, but I don't think, but anyway, um, <laughs> good questions. But yeah, so, um, you know, what we see is that it, you know, there's a way in which you can estimate what the cost improvement might have been if energy density hadn't been a concern, right? But for the application that this technology was being developed for, it was very much a concern, both specific energy and energy density. Now, if we relax those requirements, you could potentially have seen faster cost improvement. Again, it's unclear what's going to happen going in the future, but when you're talking about grid scale storage, you are relaxing a number of constraints. And so, you know, that is something that makes me think that the evolution going forward isn't, I, I'm not saying it's, it's, we're not going, I, you know, we can't predict the future in this sense. There's not much data to go by here, even if we wanted to make a data driven prediction, but um, there is the possibility certainly of much more diversification uh, among the energy storage technologies. Thank you, Jessica. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry for catalyzing uh, an extensive answer. Nicola. Uh, I think the main uh, learning for me, the most interesting learning from uh, uh, from Jessica's talk was actually this transition towards a 10 hours plus uh, requirement in terms of energy density. And this is not, in terms, sorry, in terms of hours for, for storage. And this is not lithium ion, right? Lithium ion is relatively good, uh, has a relatively cheap power in terms versus uh, energy, okay? While if you want a lot of hours, you want something which is relatively cheap in terms of storage, in terms of energy, but potentially high in terms of cost. So 
that's that tells me that basically for grid storage, lithium ion in the future might not be the right right choice. So we need we will see as we were saying, like relaxing or changing slightly over the requirements, we will probably see other technology popping up that are going to be more convenient for, uh, for that use case. So today, uh, ESS is around four hours, and that's lithium ion is quite good. But if you want to go for 10 hours plus, that's probably not lithium ion. At the same time, if you see mobility, lithium ion is actually in the sweet spot, but it depends on this, uh, where you strike the balance between cost and uh, fast charging as well as range. So if we do all, uh, for example, swapping, fast charging is not an issue anymore. So you can definitely, you might see a uh, movement away from you know, very thick graphite uh, uh, anodes, for example, because we don't need them anymore, right? So you can increase energy density, decrease cost, or if you go for something which is like, if the price of lithium sky skyrockets, then it's the moment that you would see Again, let's say a, a swapping of uh, sodium ion batteries, and you just would go a bit more often to the swapping station, but uh, but that's it, or to the charging station, obviously. But uh, that's it. So um, I agree that it's we should see the curve not as the silicon uh, uh, PV curve, but it's actually slightly different in terms of energy storage because we have so many different options that we can take, and we have just to strike a different balance between the requirements of each market. To decide what's the best technology at that specific moment. I, I, I want to add in something. Sorry to come back to the same uh, similar topic again. Very interesting discussion. I want to mention this and see uh, uh, what uh, you're, you're thinking, Jessica and, and Nicola. Is this a leveraging effect from another industry? If you look at silicon solar industry, you know it actually leveraged the whole semiconductor industry computer chips, right? And uh, uh, the uh, microprocessor, right? The whole same connecting all the knowledge built, processing, uh, supply chain. And this learning is free to solar industry. And certainly silicon has also its own benefit. Why is dominating semiconductor is uh, the stability, silicon, silicon dioxide passivation. Amazing, right? Processability of silicon oxide etching, all these things coming in. Solar industry get this for free, basically, right? If I look at now lithium ion for transportation, uh, for uh, e-mobility, and this whole industry get it for free from consumer electronics. Uh, consumer electronics already explored that for nearly, what, 20 years, right? Something years before people start to seriously explore for transportation. So I'm thinking it's still lessons learned, you know, you, these uh, industry mutually leveraging. And uh, is that uh, important for us to think further, right? Uh, Jessica, you mentioned about $10 perhaps per kilowatt hour of capital cost for, uh, you know, long duration storage. How, how could we learn from a, maybe a completely different industry to leverage that? Yeah, so I do have some thoughts on that. And I think you bring up a really good point. Um, again, I think the solar case is a bit different from the lithium ion battery case in the sense that, you know, for solar panels, it's absolutely correct that the industry learned from the semiconductor industry when solar panels, you know, our, our sol solar panels from the 1970s were providing electricity at a hundred times the cost of competitive electricity at that point, their, their advancement from there was largely supported by government policy. And there were two types of uh, instruments, market creation and R&D funding. Um, but there was a really important role of government policy in supporting the development of solar. So I think for many of the remaining challenges, including stationary energy storage, we need to be um, really recognizing the importance of government policy. Now, the thing that we see in solar is that it was government policy, but it stimulated an even greater effort in the private sector. So these market expansion policies led to a lot of private sector investment. In, and we estimate that 60% of the cost decline from um, that 99% cost decline from the 1970s came from these market expansion policies, but it was really private industry that kicked in and, 
and actually did the innovating in that case. So um, I think in the case of stationary storage, what we can learn from that, actually we can take a lesson from solar, which is that if you get these policies right, you can potentially really accelerate uh, development. And, um, you know, there's so much more. I think you guys are asking great questions. There's so much more I could say on this. Um, I don't know if we have time and I don't want to take up Nicolo's uh, couple of minutes here. So, um, <laughs> Nicolo. <Yeah. laughs> um, I, I think, I think yes, grid storage is already piggy banking on, uh, on uh, automotive because it came a bit later. It's just that we always focus on the battery cell because that's the most, uh, come on, we are electrochemists, it's the most amazing part of the story. But even when we are going to change all the battery cells to another technology, let's say sodium ion, the grid storage industry already is going to use the same inverters, the same battery management system, et cetera, that they develop using lithium ion, which was developed by the automotive industry, which was coming from, from the consumer electronic industry. So I think it's, if we don't focus only on, on the cells, it's already like something that they are using for free from another industry, the grid storage industry, and it's actually the automotive one. Oh. Thank you, Nicolo. Will, back to you. Well, we're having so much fun. I'm afraid our time is almost up now. Ordinarily, at the end of this uh, seminar, uh, E or I will ask you to sort of give advice to students and up and coming scientists working in the area. But I thought I would uh, make a twist. Um, you know, over the next 10 years, trillions will be invested in this area. And, uh, you know, some of those decision makers are in this seminar. So I wonder if you each have a one minute um, advice to give to the decision makers who are making big billion dollar bets into the future, especially when it comes to this holistic level thinking. Maybe I should give a pause so you can form your answers. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I can go, I can go first. Um, I have, let's say, two um, pieces of advice. And, um, you know, that would be to, um, you know, one is, is well, it, they're both related to being more deliberate about investment. So I think oftentimes we follow intuition more than we follow the data and more than we follow careful mechanistic studies of technology development. But as we've all experienced over the last two years, there, and, and I would say the field of public health, epidemiology and vaccine and, and medical intervention development does this better than other areas of technology. But, you know, there can be a very deliberate effort in rapid technological development. But that means looking really under the hood of technologies, looking at the mechanisms of improvement, also understanding how a single technology will impact a larger system. And I think the one point I wanted to make more than anything else with my talk today is that we can be more deliberate in this area as well in energy storage. In fact, energy storage is a key candidate for this. And I think this also applies to students. So that's also a little message for students. Um, and, you know, my other point is really about thinking about the right balance between diversification and concentration in your investment portfolios. And I'll stop there um, and move to uh, Nicolo. So he has some time as well. Thank, Thank you, you, Jessica. So for me, there are two points. So I would like to, uh, you know, decision makers should, uh, should look not only in how cool uh, is, is the technology or what uh, technology. It's very important to keep an open mind of new next generation batteries, et cetera. But there are so many different ideas that we are risk to be a bit dispersed if we don't focus also on the economics. So not start with, okay, I have this cool product. What can I do with it often enough? But am I answering an actual problem of the world with this technology and therefore is it uh, worth uh, worth exploring or at least keep up on a balance and open mind on both and the second one i would like to underline and uh, i would like us all to focus on something which is also sustainable because it's great that you have a new technology that can bring down the cost uh, and in the short term might be a solution but the old story what we are all actually here for in electrochemistry especially is to get to a decarbonization of our industry so if we 
have this new technology that is based on elements that are super rare and super difficult to, to get out of the ground, or they might actually be harmful, maybe this is not the right answer, you know, even if it's not too expensive, that we should also think about how much does it emit to, to get this material, to transform them and to make them to the batteries that we're going to use every day. Jessica, Nicolo, thank you very much for this uh, spirited discussion and your deep presentations. Uh, I really very much appreciate it. So this brings us to the end of the seminar. And Evan, if I can have the closing slides, please. Um, we're going to have um, uh, oh, uh, two more seminars this, uh, uh, this quarter, this uh, winter quarter. Uh, so please uh, stay tuned uh, for more information and register for the new events. And with that, I'd um, like to thank everyone again for attending and joining us this morning at Stanford. Thank you very much and have a great weekend.